Hi guys, this is Barry Cook from the Changi Kwan. In our first video attempt at a blog, in the absence of a suggested topic, I'm going to choose a generic conversation that we can have, uh, which is which martial arts style is best and does it matter about the person's frame or age well which martial art is best is really difficult to answer because it depends on the person even if you're multi-skilled and you're a massive athlete if you have a particular body frame um, if you're heavy or if you're muscular or if you're quite static in your approach to um, tackling particular tasks then someone would suggest that perhaps uh, Jiu Jitsu, Judo, something uh, of a grappling nature would be suited to you but at the end of the day if that's not the type of environment or the, the set of skills that you're looking to develop then it doesn't matter about your frame or your your size it's really just a preference about what style you'd like to study and then you can always improve from there it, it's not it's not always primarily dictated by your shape or your frame so which art is best uh, isn't really the appropriate question it's which do you want to do and then can your frame or your abilities match the style that you're trying to train in so for example with me uh, I started in judo and as a child I was nine so I'm already you know you're you're small of frame at that size you know that age so I didn't I didn't do judo because I was heavy or muscular it was simply because it was the nearest um, martial arts to me martial arts club to me so that's what my family put me into and even though I wasn't particularly big at nine it was it still gave a great set of skills and produced a great foundation for me to build what would become my martial arts career in later life so it's not even though I wasn't big it wasn't detrimental to me I didn't uh, fail you know every time I, I would spar or uh, grapple it, it wasn't like I was suffering because everyone was was heavier than me you're put with a weight class so you would train with other people who are uh, appropriate to your age group or your weight class or your grade so they they tend to be the three areas that they choose for you to train with i suppose if you look at it from a, a defensive point of view if you're not training with heavier people and you you stay within those three levels for your type of training then it's going to impact your ability to use those skills because you're not being pushed so if you're attacked or you have to grapple with someone who's considerably bigger than you then even with your skill set you're, you're gonna suffer because you're not used to dealing with that kind of weight and strength so as you get older I mean I was uh, 9 and I, I left by the time I was 12 so I didn't have that chance to develop by training with older people because we were all pretty much the same uh, it was only in later life that I developed uh, more grappling skills so judo would you know it is a great foundation for anyone if they wanted to do even though it's not classed as a martial art it's it, it's very much combat relative if you think that most fights most encounters in the street end up in some kind of scuffle 
or, or grapple anyway and it ends up going to the floor. So once you're past the kicking and punching phase of which there isn't in, in judo primarily, then your judo skills would come into play and your arm locks and your strangles and, and your pinning of the person would all come into play and of course they'd be exceptional skills at that time. If you were hit or kicked hard enough prior to the scuffle or the grapple then of course uh, you would be in a a negative point at that stage so judo is good but if you don't want to grapple and you do karate but someone says you're heavy you should do judo then it's I wouldn't listen to people who say this this martial art or that martial art or you're very thin you should do taekwondo or you're you know you're very stocky or muscular you should do karate i think it people are looking at your frame and they're going off your stature or your height or your 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 weight and then they're relating that to something it's like saying if you're tall then you should play basketball i know lots of tall people who have never played pas basketball and you know they've played other sports so but people think oh you're you're this stature or you're this stature or you're you're this weight then you should do that so i think it comes down to what you want to do not what people think you're built to do because we know as adults that anything we're, we're sort of forced to do or coerced to do we don't stick at it for very long because it's not a passion of ours, it's not something we want to do. So the best martial art, to summarise that question, is the art that you want to do. Because the art that you want to do is the art that you'll have longevity in. It's the art that you'll stay in. Uh, if you have an interest and a passion for what you're doing, you'll do it for longer. It goes without saying. But if you're doing something because you feel your your frame or weight is suited to that art but there's no real passion then the, the chances of, of you staying in that system for a while is probably very limited so any art that you want to practice is the best martial art for you it's the one that will give you the most success because you'll stay there the longest now that doesn't mean to say that judo is a, a better martial art than karate or taekwondo is a, a better martial art than jiu-jitsu it's just the, the, the starting point should be what do you want to do what do you want to be because we don't fight every day unless we we fight for a living you know unless we're boxers or compete in MMA or some martial art or some fighting uh, environment that pays you professionally and therefore it's your living then you're going to study things that are specifically relevant to what you need to do for your job essentially if you're being paid for it but if you're doing martial arts like 99% of us um, as a way of life and a way to keep fit and something to to you know put into your life to, to bring extra uh, gratification or um, benefit to yourself you know uh, such as changing character building character getting rid of flaws and and just basically improving yourself overall by using martial systems then it doesn't matter what art you do so that being said i have done several martial arts over my life and i wouldn't say that i enjoyed any one mar one one art more than another so i've done grappling arts for long periods of time i've done striking arts for the majority of time and I, I enjoy training in both which is why I tell my students that 
particularly uh, in these modern times, students shouldn't be limiting themselves to one system because no one system has everything. You know, if you had the time and the finances, m my advice would be to do a different art every day of the week. Now, when you go to a karate club, you're going to be submersed and influenced by the philosophy and the teachings of that system. The same if you go to a jiu-jitsu club, that you're going to be drowned in, in that philosophy. And if you were just doing that system and just allowing that one philosophy to sort of become who you are and, and develop you as a martial artist, that's brilliant. But if you're just going from style to style in order to take as much uh, martial arts information and, and education as you can in order to make you as rounded as possible, then it's going to be difficult because not only will you learn um, if you if you went to karate and learned how to kick and punch like in a in a karate class in a Japanese way and then you went to taekwondo on another night and learned kicking and punching in that way collecting those two sets of skills are good but the philosophy may be conflicting so you know karate might be saying oh you know things are done this way for this reason and take on say no it's done this way for this reason and so it puts conflicting argumentative uh, information in your head and it's not positive like a contrast it's not you know is this way better or this way better you don't want that as a student all you want is to look at two ways of doing something and which one is the best for me or for you it's not which is the best because no no method of learning anything whether it's academic or general sport or martial art no one kick no no way of doing a particular kick is the one way like in anything in life it's all about what's the best way for you so if you're learning to do a kick in karate and a kick in taekwondo and you go to uh, kickboxing another night and you learn the same kick there and the, the three philosophies or three methods are different then it's going to be difficult for you you know you can't just turn up to a club and do the physical and go home so you're going to have all of the other stuff going on which you don't need it's clouding you know it, it's giving you um, it's making you stop and take thought of the three when that's it's irrelevant to you what you're trying to do is make yourself more rounded as a as a you know in skill wise for combat perspective now when i teach my students i've i've always been conscious that what i didn't want the the, the two things that I, I don't want i don't want my students to be buddhist monks so I'm not teaching them to sit in robes uh, under a waterfall at the top of a mountain and meditate all day. But I do want elements of that for them. I'm also not training Olympic athletes. I don't want my students to train with a sport mindset. So I will teach them the speed that can come from developing kicks from a sports perspective but when you add certain things to those techniques it takes it outside the sports bracket because sports kicks and uh, traditional kicks or combat kicks are all taught slightly differently the kick would look the same from a third person perspective but the way they're taught and the way they're practiced are all slightly different so Whilst I don't want my students to be, you know, Olympic gold medalists or Buddhist monks, what I look for, like with everything I do in martial arts, is an amalgamation, a a way of, of taking all of those things and putting them together and making the student as rounded as possible. So they're not just fighters. They're not just training for, say, 
uh, you know, a, an MMA competition or, uh, you know, a freestyle or open martial arts championships. Um, because in Chongi Kwan, I don't, I specifically teach um, techniques that are non-classical. So that is to say that the kicks look the same because a front kick is a front kick, whatever art you do. The idea is to is to load in a particular way, execute the the desired effect that we want from that kick, and then to get out of that situation or to move forwards, whatever we're doing. So, but the thought behind the practice for the kick, that's what's different. So, it's very difficult because if you train long enough, and therefore if you if you de develop a lot of experience because in your time of training you're training in multiple arts, you're training with multiple people, you're training in multiple countries so all of these experiences are developing you as a martial artist or developing your skills as a, a teacher or coach whatever your position is and if you if you observe closely enough and you ask enough questions and you engage enough in the various types of training then you'll see that the slight variances that are behind the application of the techniques are what make people train in particular areas so with Chongi Kwam, um we we would do all the kicks and punches that someone might do in a karate class or in a taekwondo class and the loads might be the same or the execution might look the same but it's the mindset it's the thought behind how you're applying those techniques so in competition if it was a karate kick for example you in shotokan which is part of my background um the execution is semi-contact although it's still relatively powerful it's not there's a slight pulling in that you know if, if you knock out or you, you injure um, then you're disqualified and the points go against you so you're you're always of a mindset that when you perform your technique that you're not you're not fully letting go you're not trying to knock out whereas taekwondo which is also part of my martial arts background the, the idea when you launch your techniques is to hit as hard as you can and knock out if possible but most Taekwondo competitors won't kick as hard as they can to knock out because when they purposefully try to put power into the techniques it slows them down so if they practice on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in a Taekwondo class they're more than likely 90% of their training is going to be for speed so it's all about cardiovascular running fast kicking fast fast combinations and it's all about how many points you can score as fast as you can within the, the time frame of the round that you're fighting in so although you can knock out it's it tends to make their kicks slower and so they tend not to go for that as much you know, I'm generalizing now, there's, there's no absolutes, but in general, um, heavyweights um, and super heavyweights in Taekwondo, who are already slower, I suppose, than all the, you know, the the faster, lighter ones, they they tend to kick quite hard, but they, they can also take hard hits. So, again, it becomes, you know, um, swings and roundabouts about, can, is the partner taking hits because he's used to it, because he's heavy? Uh, even though the person kicking is slower, but he's kicking harder. So, both of those elements, the Shotokan and the uh, Taekwondo, if you were to look at a Chongi Guan class, the kicks are the same. It's just the mindset. When I teach a student to throw a kick or a punch, what I'm trying to get them to do is, you know, the technique isn't magical. It's no different from one art to another, or a block, and it's all the same. But it's the mind, it's the thought process, it's what's behind what's happening. So when you apply your block for your defence and then what you do next, or whether you're 
the offensive person because you've managed to get in first even though the person's the attacker it's, it's what's in the head so you you know you're in Chongguan for example my students know that they're not training for rounds so fitness for example they they're not going 13 rounds or they're not going three rounds like in taekwondo um or whatever the rounds are in boxing these days 13 rounds 10 rounds so that type of stamina isn't necessary not to say that fitness isn't necessary it absolutely is um you know the, a fight with a single person can take a lot out of you so if, if he's got friends and you're fighting multiple people then you know boy your fitness better be good but the philosophy behind the overall training is what can i fit into this fight that makes the possibility of it being a success for me what will it work what what will work for me what can i bring to this so not training with a sport mindset is the first thing in chongi kwan so when you throw your kicks and techniques whilst you're not throwing with full speed and power in class the mindset is if if i was doing this for real you know this is what i'd be doing this is how i would be approaching this and i think if if you're kicking paddles in taekwondo or if you're uh, doing basics moving up and down the room in karate if the mindset is i'm training for you know rounds where the referee will step in if i get tired or you know this can happen and that can happen and there's always judges stopping the fight and the flow isn't always there because of the officials so you're training with a mindset of that and even if you um, aren't a sports person if you belong to a taekwondo club i mean when i when i was just doing taekwondo um it, it was a sport club and so the training was fast and it was hard all the time and the fitness was just amazing you know and, and the techniques and everything was just great but for people who weren't there for the sporting aspect they just wanted to do a martial art maybe do a bit of fitness and uh, get some some skills and, and make some friends and the social side of it I, I don't know how they would have coped with that I, I think new people and perhaps new people over a certain age um, didn't last very long because it was just too dynamic the the pace is just too it, it makes it specific you're either here to train to be an athlete or you're not so I think that's good if you only want to teach athletes but I think it's bad because it excludes the people who do want to train um, who don't want to be athletes so but at the end of the day a taekwondo fighter with all that fitness and all that speed um that's great and in in a martial arts environment in a taekwondo environment and in a in a taekwondo championships you know if you if you watch taekwondo championships and you you see the right people then it's outstanding you know you just you're gasping you're, wow you know so fast and how do they do this and I didn't even see that coming in and the person's knocked on the floor um, and and you know completely opposite you know karate is uh, a lot slower to that you know but it's 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 very you know karate is very strong it's very dynamic it's very much you know you develop an internal strength and then that seems to show in your actions and your techniques and and it's very powerful you know everything's it comes together in a in a way that is I, I i haven't felt that the feeling i got when i when i'm when i do karate and when i did karate the the feeling that the, the mind and the body have when they come together from karate training uh submersed in the karate philosophy there's it's very special and so but if you if you put those two people together if you could put we'll go on to that if you could put the same person fighting himself using the two different styles only 
then that would be you you would you would see oh this person hits harder but this person hits faster and if you listen to Einstein then if he's hitting fast he's also hitting hard um, but when people say oh is you know you see these videos on YouTube um, karate versus taekwondo or, or jiu jitsu versus uh, judo it's it's not realistic I don't mean in a street realistic I mean um, one person might have had a, a bad day or he may have a he may be getting over a, a bug an illness of some kind or they just you know the, the, there's so many variables that just by putting two people together and saying this one is this label and this one is this label let's see which is the best because if you did that maybe 50 times it might be they both win 25 fights that having two people fight once and say right that art better that doesn't make sense to me because you don't know you know what did that person get a good night's sleep or you know and it's okay you know you could say that that's irrelevant if they're fighting then you know once they're in that fight it doesn't matter if they've had sleep but it does any of you who have um, had to defend yourself outside or if you've competed for any amount of time you'll know if your nutrition is bad if you're eating badly then you'll fight badly that doesn't mean the art is bad it means you're putting on a bad show that day if you haven't slept well if you've got a headache you know that there are so many variables and it doesn't mean that one art better than another and in a way I hate the comparison of things like that um, rather than have them fight against each other why don't you merge them together and have a system of both of them now I know a lot of a lot of my Taekwondo friends who are Taekwondo instructors very few of them this is in the in the US mostly uh, very very few of them teach Taekwondo as a singular art almost all the Taekwondo people that I know high-ranking people you know sort of sixth and above who teach Taekwondo teach Hapkido which is a sort of uh, Korean Jiu Jitsu um, Korean Jiu Jitsu Korean uh, Aikido when uh, when they teach they teach both of those styles because they realize that Taekwondo as excellent as it is with its its stamina and its speed and its kicks you know it's known Taekwondo is known for flexibility and kicking and there are a few arts that could compete with just kicks against Taekwondo because that that's all they do so they're very good at what they do um, but as we've said no art has everything and therefore if a Taekwondo person who needs room to use his legs if he's uh, having to deal with an encounter and he has no space you know if it's in an incline uh, uh, a small space and he's attacked he needs room to use his weapons so what a lot of instructors a long time ago realized is that we need to have some form of uh, close quarter fighting skills to add to our kicks and so they 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 brought Hapkido and Taekwondo and they merged them together and they teach that in class as one and they might still call it a Taekwondo class or they may issue a dual grade in Taekwondo and, and Hapkido um, I know schools that do both but the concept of merging the two so that you have a, a distance you know a you're learning skills at, at a distance striking then um, that that is the way to go and yet in the UK all of the, the friends that I have that teach Taekwondo again um, six seven eighth and above um, they just teach Taekwondo they, they don't want to know anything else and I'm not saying everybody I'm saying the people I know they want to stick solely to teaching Taekwondo um, and, and they're just happy to, to deal with that and there's no problem with that if Taekwondo's 
um, your life and that's your passion like I said at the start of this this vlog um, if that's your passion and you want to you know you've trained in your passion and you want to teach your passion that's great but for me when when I started teaching I, I, I was just teaching Taekwondo um, I was teaching the cookie one method of Taekwondo when my club opened in 2003 but I very quickly realized within the first two years of teaching um, a lot of the self-defense part of the class I thought I'm having to hold back skills that I know and not teach it to the students because it wasn't part of the doctrine or the, the, the philosophy of Taekwondo um, and I thought people I was just leaving people exposed to attack because they weren't being given these extra skills so that's when I realized it's for me uh, my passion is is making sure that students are as fully armed as possible for life not for the ring or the cage or whatever it is that you know that people do so I, I decided quickly that that Taekwondo wasn't the way I wanted to take my students and so that's what I did and the Tongi Kwon was formed and what I did was um, I merged the the training that I the extensive the training that I'd had that was extensive in certain arts not just arts that I, I, I'd done for five minutes I mean the ones that I'd done the longest um, I sat down and I analysed everything. I took the philosophy out of it because I, my own philosophy would come across um, from then um, about 30 years of, of training. So I, I looked at everything, analysed everything and thought what, what's the best way to do this? It's, and I decided it was to have limitless technique available for the students. Uh, and therefore they, they would have access to everything that they needed to have in order for them to decide what was best for them and what would work best for them. Because I wasn't teaching sport, I wasn't tied to, you can't do this, you can't do that, um, everything's got to fit within three minutes, you can't go outside of this area or you're going to get penalised. It, it, it's a completely different concept but that didn't mean that I couldn't use all of the education and knowledge that I'd been given from the arts that I'd done it absolutely meant that I could use all of that but without the restrictions of you can't do this you can't do that you can't go there so it was it was a really good opportunity to to make this and form this and then start to teach it to people um, and since then um, it, it's it's just come on in leaps and bounds and it, it developed as a philosophy of its own quite quickly and then since then um that it, it's been it's been like that ever since so to round this one up um which is the best martial art whichever's whichever art is you think is best for you if you want to be a grappler and that's what you like and you're really thin and you think everyone's going to be muscular then you know you can either put on some weight or lift some weights or you can train with with lighter people you know whatever makes you happy unless like i said unless you're training professionally where you need to beat people you know for an income then it doesn't matter you know we don't fight every day in the street and we don't fight in championships unless we're athletes we're most of us just train for a way of life which is why when I teach my students it's not just about fighting my club is is the Chungi one is far from about fighting that's that's the that's the reason to train to develop your defensive skills and your combat skills and teach you about awareness and and how to escalate or de-escalate at the appropriate times but aside from all of that physical combat grittiness there's also the philosophy and if there's no martial arts philosophy then you're just a fighter and if you're just a fighter then you're not a martial artist artist means that you're 
you follow a philosophy, you follow a set of rules, you have self-discipline, self-control, and you walk a path. But walking a path doesn't mean that you have to do, you have to follow this philosophy or that philosophy. So I, I think that, that that's why the Chunky Kwan came about, and it seems to have helped a lot of people, and it's taken away a lot of the things that I found um, gave people struggling issues, things you know that they they didn't understand or they didn't need, and it basically just filled their head with with stuff that they didn't need. And when they're sparring, they're thinking, "What technique shall I use?" You know, and and they don't have time for that. In combat, you've just got to get on with it. So that's how the Chongi Kwan came about, and. Um, that's where we are today. So, whether you are a student of the martial arts, you know, if you train, then that's great. You know, keep going. If you can, try to add other bits to it and be as rounded as you can. And if you don't, then well, and uh, start training. If that's not for you, try another club, try another art, uh, do some research into things. But. Martial art is, is the best thing you can do, and if you can if you can find a club, a group of people that are like-minded and as eager about your development as theirs, then that's the club you need to be in. Uh, next video coming soon. If there's any topics that you'd like to discuss, any information you want to look over, any comparisons, then uh, please leave some uh, comments below, and I'll I'll have a look at those and see what we can do. Other than then, I'll see you next time. Take care.